It's not supposed to be possible to get a total electronics failure on a modern rebreather, but that's exactly what happened to me. I was 74 meters down, or 240 feet in old money if you prefer. In this video I'm going to explain exactly what happened and how I survived to dive another day. I'm also going to tell you about a very similar experience that I'd had just weeks before. Unfortunately I don't have any dive video, but what I do have is lots of stills and images and I've also got the dive logs that I'm going to use extensively to explain what happened. I hope that's useful to you. If it is, please leave us a like or drop us a comment. But what I'd like to do now is give you a bit of context first of all. So these incidents took place in 2020. It was just after we'd come out of the uh, the first COVID lockdown and we were all really excited to be uh, to be getting back to diving. We decided that what we were going to do was a wreck called the Ambassador. Uh, it's an old 19th century steamship sunk in a collision, sits in about 50 metres of water and on its day, and this was absolutely its day, it's a lovely dive. There's a steering quadrant, there's the rudder, you can see the prop is, is gorgeous, there's a lovely drive shaft there and uh, here's some bits of engine and there's some boilers. So you can see it's a great dive. And I was having a, I was having a lovely time. You see the depth there, sort of 48, 49 meters. Uh, it's a bit of a lump there. But then uh, round about here, that's when I had my issue. And the issue that I had is this. I look down and see the handset is full of water. And that's one of those real kind of heart in the mouth moments. You, you, you talk about it, you train for it. Uh, but then when you actually see that, it's a real, um, you know, a real moment, frankly. And, and, and particularly as I was, you know, at this point in the dive here, so I've got 40 odd minutes of decompression to do and I need to figure out how I'm going to get to the surface. Now, I've got plenty of bailout gas, so I could have bailed out. That wouldn't have been a problem at all. But um, most modern rebreathers, and the AP is no different, have redundancy for exactly this kind of situation. So so what you're seeing here is a, a bit of the rebreather. It's, it's the same bit, just looked at two different angles. It's the kind of head with the electronics and other bits and pieces in it. So on the left-hand side here, you can see there's the uh, display unit, which obviously would normally give you PO2, your depth, your decompression information. It's also got the buttons on it for controlling the rebreather. That's all there. This thing here is the head-up display, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. And then over here is the uh, the beeper, the much dreaded AP beeper, which uh, anybody who's dived with an inspo diver will uh, will will know all about that. So underneath the lid, this is what it looks like. You can see you've got three O2 sensors. There's a battery, there's a solenoid, and various other bits and pieces. But the things I would like you to focus on are these. Uh, it sort of surrounded by the three uh, by the by the green dotted lines rather and inside there are the two controllers uh, one um, and the leds and there's two lights associated with each controller so so you've got that, that duplication there and th what the controllers do is they maintain the po2 so they use the information from the sensors and to control the solenoid to maintain the po2 at whatever level is set now when the handset failed flooded I lost the ability to change that set point, but the controllers were going to maintain it at whatever um, I, I, it was at the time. So in my case, it was 1.3 bar because that's what I'd had on the bottom. Now, the handset also provides uh, pressure information, i.e. depth information, so that the head loses that, the controllers lose that. So all they're going to do is just maintain the uh, PO2 at whatever the uh, the last um, you know direction they were given. So that is uh, the um, that that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to and this is how it's going to be shown to you. It's going to be through the uh, the the HUD. And normally during a dive, you expect green uh, two green lights. So one on the left for the controller one, and one on the right for controller two. That means it's safe to dive. But one of the things AP are really keen to point out is that the HUD also provides sufficient information for a manual ascent. So it will warn you if you get dangerous PO2, so that's too low. 
um, slow flashing. Fast flashing is uh, too high, but kind of critically for um, this dive is the fact that if you deviate from the set point by more than 0.2 bar, you are going to get this slow flashing light. So I was paying particular attention for that and I didn't get it on the ascent. So I knew that the unit was maintaining the PO2 at the level that it had been set. And what that meant is that I could use my offboard shear water, i.e. the one that's not connected to the rebreather, completely independent, um, but it knows the set point that I'm diving. It obviously has pressure information because it's got a depth sensor, so therefore it can calculate my decompression, and that's exactly what happened. So I used the decompression information on the shear water, and you can see there, I cleared all my deco stops and I then did a bit longer because, you know, why wouldn't you? Obviously, I've got plenty of gas on the rebreather and it just, you know, means that if the PO2 hasn't been bang on the money, it's, uh, it's clearly building me a bit of credit in the bank. But right at the end of the dive, I knew that the unit wasn't going to be able to maintain uh, or was going to try to maintain 1.3 bar once we came up to the surface. Clearly, it couldn't do that when the ambient pressure is one bar. So right at the end of the dive, I bailed out onto my 50% that I was carrying and I did the, the ascent from six meters to the surface um, having bailed out. I'd also closed my O2 cylinder at that point so it didn't just carry on throwing um, oxygen out. And that all worked very well. I got up to the surface, there I am, all happy. I've survived, I've done all my deco. I've done the vast majority of it on the rebreather and I'm gonna get on the bow and all will be well. So this is um, this worked this worked really well and I guess is the kind of um, failure that you would expect um, in this circumstance. But what happens on the next dive is is a very, very different failure. Before I talk about it though, I, I know people always like to know where things are. So uh, this is uh, the United Kingdom and you can see here down the very southwest, this is Plymouth uh, up here where, where I live. And out to sea, we've got the Edison Lighthouse, which is a kind of well-known local landmark or, or possibly sea mark. And the Ambassador, which is the first uh, handset failure is over here off to the east and the wreck that we're diving on the second failure is the uh, is out here uh, known uh, not particularly imaginatively as the coal block wreck and the reason it's known as a coal block wreck is because obviously it's full of patent fuel coal blocks those things have got bzb on them um, which we think indicates that it's uh, some sort of origin in the continent, perhaps, you know, Belgium or Holland or Germany or, or somewhere like that. But we, we don't really know. Um, there's all sorts of interesting bits and pieces on it like that. Uh, there's the engine. We've tried to identify it um, by measuring the, the cylinders and, and not really got anywhere with that. There's also various other bits of engine machinery and stuff around in it. And uh, there you go. Uh, lovely boiler. So it's it's a nice wreck. Nice dive. Fran and myself got in, I think with the first pair down. The shot wasn't quite on the wreck, so we had to uh, use distance line to kind of reel off. And eventually we came on the wreck. And, and kind of shortly after I got on the wreck, I looked down and I had a very, very similar handset failure to the, to the well, identical handset failure to the one that I'd, I'd had before. Only this one's at 74 meters. Luckily, not quite as long into the dive as uh, as the first one, but I was really, really frustrated. L loads of reasons for that. I mean, the first thing is that um, I'd only just started the dive, so I was going to be missing the rest of the dive. I, I knew that. Uh, second thing is, you know, I'd had one of these merely a month before, so that was really, really irritating. And the third thing is it wasn't my handset, it was somebody else's. So my recollection at the time is is I um, looked down at the handset, saw it was completely flooded with water, and I just pressed a whole load of buttons in all sorts of different sequences. And when I came to look at the HUD, the HUD was uh, was dead. There was no lights in that. So, so there's a different scenario. I no longer have the HUD. I no longer have the handset. So th there is only one option there, which is to, uh, to bail out. So I bailed out onto uh, my 1464 bottom mix carrying on on the left hand side. And then I, I swam back to the lazy shot, uh, as you can see there. So um, you question why why I did that? Well, the reason is because I knew that there was an eighty percent up on the up on the line. I had 
felt I had quite a lot of gas. I had a buddy with me who had quite a lot of gas. So um, I felt that it was there was no issues with that. I then came up, you know, relatively rapidly up the uh, up the shot line onto the lazy shot. And then when I got to about 20 meters, I changed onto my 50%. Stayed on my 50% until I got up to um, 80, sorry, got up to six meters where the 80% was. And as you can see there, I spent the rest of the time on the 80%. Uh, cleared my deco and then I actually switched back to the 50% so I left so left the 80% in the water where it was as part of the lazy shot system and then came up uh, the rest of the time on my 50% and um, you know got to surface without any problems at all so in fact I, I was so comfortable on the deco stops that I actually was able to take some pictures so there's Fran who was with me as my buddy she was she was brilliant uh, there is a photo of the two of us. You can see um, the the sort of clip system on uh, my right is is the one that's suspending the um, the eighty percent. And as I say, that was part of the the lazy shot system. And you can see I'm I'm breathing on it there, so I'm on open circuit. And uh, Fran, my buddy, is up there behind me, keeping a uh, keeping a good eye on me. And I think there you go, one more, another another selfie of myself on the. Uh, on the on the eighty percent, so actually uh, fairly chilled, fairly relaxed, worked really well, and um, end result got to surface without any problems at all. I know it's the same photo. I only, I only have one surfacing photo, so uh, so so there it is. So uh, a few interesting things to pick up there. So I'm going to start with the uh, which is the obvious one, which is I can already hear people out there going. Uh, AP, you shouldn't dive in AP, you should dive this unit or you should dive that unit or these are better or this never happens to whatever uh, you know your particular personal favourite unit is. Um, now, there's no doubt at all that AP went through a bad uh, sequence at this time. You know, I know a few other people who had handset problems with the cables um, and those kind of things. What I would say is that all units, all dive computers, all underwater electronics you know, can and do go wrong. So I know people with lots of other models of um, rebreather, lots of other models of computer that have had similar issues to this. And I did a Facebook post uh, about this, um, you know, about a week before I made this video. And on there, there's, you know, different people who are flagging up issues they've had with, with different units. So let's leave the unit bashing. Uh, it's all good fun. We all enjoy it. It's all a good bit of a a bit of banter but the fundamental thing is these are all complex things they all have the potential to go wrong underwater and you know that that happens so what do you need to be able to do in those situations well the the number one thing for me is you need to have a bailout plan that is going to work and as you can see on this dive my bailout plan worked worked you know really well so uh, I went through those three um three transfers you know from my bottom mix to my 50% and then onto the 80% that was on the line and you know that was that was that was great in terms of uh, other things that I think worked really well um, I'm going to flag up my buddy Fran she's appeared in a few of my videos she is a fantastic person to dive with and clearly she uh, she didn't have an awful lot to do on this but she was there all the time she was checking that I'd made uh, switches she was checking that my handset correct uh, or my computer settings were correct and all those kind of things and just having somebody next to you when when things aren't going going so well is is really really nice so having a, having a buddy is something I'm a big fan of uh something that I I guess I uh, you know maybe not so, so so pleased with myself for you know the uh, the suggestion is uh, from AP is that when my handset flooded all the buttons that I pressed I managed to operate the turn off sequence and I actually shut the unit down now that is entirely possible um, so so even though the screen was dead the buttons were still responsive and it was me pressing buttons that managed to turn it off so you know that's that seems reasonable I can't come up with any other explanation so I'm going to go with the AP suggestion that I disabled the HUD it kind of doesn't matter in the sense of I had to deal with it underwater and had to, to, to sort it all out but for anybody in the future if you have an issue like this I would say um, you know don't don't randomly start pressing buttons um, because you may have unintended consequences 
I guess the other thing that I need to mention, of course, is that you aren't supposed to be able to turn a rebreather off underwater. So how on earth did I manage to do that? Once again, this came up in the discussion that I had with AP. And if you think about it, the thing that prevents a rebreather from being turned off underwater is when it senses ambient pressure, you know, greater than normal. So on the uh, inspiration, that information comes from the pressure sensor. Pressure sensor is on the handset. When the handset floods, uh, clearly the pressure sensor uh, dies as well. So what must have happened is a particularly, I had a particularly small window of opportunity where the, uh, the screen on the handset had gone, the pressure sensor on the handset had gone, but the buttons were still functional. And somehow during that, that brief window was when I managed to turn the, uh, to turn the handset off. That's the, the only explanation any of us can come up with. I mean, if you've got a better one, then um, obviously I, I would love to hear it. It'd be really interesting. But as as far as you know, I'm concerned, I just had a particularly, well, I obviously had a, a particularly misfortunate set of circumstances full stop. But then that was compounded by this, um, me being able to turn it off during this brief window when the sensor was dead, the handset screen was dead, but the buttons were still functioning and still communicating with the uh, with the controller in the head. So um, there you go. Uh, <laughs> it was my unlucky day. So uh, that's, I guess, um, me critiquing myself in terms of anything that we do differently now. I guess uh, one of the things that we do differently is we no longer put the 80% as part of the lazy shot system. We now have the 80% on the boat uh, along. In fact, we have a much more comprehensive drop system, cylinder system now, and that is available. So if you do need to come up directly from the wreck, you can call for it and it can be brought over to you rather than you having to get back to the lazy shot system to, to, to get that um, rich deco mix. So that's probably the big change that we've uh, we've we've made as a result of this. Um, so yeah, well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, hearing about my uh, double handset failure, including the, that really rare one, the the total electronics failure. And if you've enjoyed it and you found it useful, it would be really good if you give us a like. If you have something to say, leave us a comment. That's always really appreciated. And other than that. I will look forward to seeing you uh, on the next one of my videos.